Thank you. I also want to uh, thank Jan and Elizabeth for uh, all the things they've done to help get us here. It's been a lot of work, uh, including some uh, corrections they had to do in the last couple of days. So I appreciate uh, being here. I, I have a little bit of a connection uh, to the Stegner Center indirectly because I used to uh, be the director of the Vermont Natural Resources Council many years ago. And uh, Mr. Stegner was a, a member of the VNRC because he spent part of his year usually in Greensboro, Vermont. I never got to meet him, unfortunately, but uh, someone who, uh, whose importance resonates not just in the West, but around the rest of the country. I also have to correct something in my biography, which is uh, that it says in there that I went to Middlebury and graduated in 1975, but that's actually when I got out of high school. <laughs> <laughs> so let me start. The, uh, I want to make a few uh, main points before I, I start talking about energy security and climate and these 10 converging solutions. First is that we need to operate energy and climate uh, pr uh, policy on some principles. The first should be to use markets to create competition and choice in energy, to try to um, push prices down, try to bring renewable, sustainable energy into the uh, marketplace. The second thing is mandates. We always, in this country, pair our markets with mandates. The FDA, Federal Drug Administration, uh, USDA, uh, the Fed, everything we do is regulated in ways uh, for the protection of the, of the public interest. We should have the same approach in uh, energy policy where we'll create some mandates both to lower carbon emissions but also bring uh, diversity and sustainability into our energy supply. Third principle, innovation. Uh, we are probably the world's greatest engine for technology and science. We should continue to lead with that. We should build science and technology. It's where we're going to get surprised by solutions uh, to the energy and climate challenge. And uh, to walk away from that, as we appear to have done in the last few years, is a major mistake. Next, cooperation. We need to work with uh, states, cities, other countries, people who have been uh, showing wisdom on energy and climate. We also need to work internationally toward uh, cooperative agreements about how we're going to deal with energy and climate problems in ways that don't punish those who participate. And last, integration. These energy and climate policies that I'm going to suggest to you need to be implemented together boldly and quickly. If they are not implemented together, we end up with uh, large problems across the economy and throughout the uh, uh, energy policy arena. Let me start by thanking uh, the people who and uh, publications who will probably regret that I learned to scan. Uh, and lucky for you, um, I haven't figured out how to scan in uh, movie clips or anything like that, but unluckily for you, I'm not an expert scanner. So I hope you'll be able to read some of this. Uh, thanks to the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, The Economist, McKinsey Global Institute, the Natural Resources Defense Council, Field and Stream, and uh, Governor Bill Richardson, who uh, let me work on his uh, new book, Leading by Example, and much of the content of what I'm about to say is actually in that book. This you can't read. This is part of my problem about scanning. But down at the bottom, you'll see, if you come up real close, that Field and Stream runs a monthly uh, poll, reader's poll. This one was about, basically, do you believe, as a Field and Stream reader, that climate change is real? 62% of the respondents said, yes, it's a real problem. We're worried about the impacts on habitat and recreation and hunting and fishing. 29% uh, said that it was a hoax uh, put forward by vegan tree dwellers. So, <laughs> so uh, I'm sure there are a few vegan tree dwellers in the audience. Um, I'm not one myself, but I think we should acknowledge that uh, they've been ahead of the curve on climate. And I am an environmental advocate, so some of what I say uh, might not make people in industry completely happy, but I think we need balance in this discussion. The, uh, 
Let's get into energy and uh, security issues right now, oil in particular. This slide keeps changing. Uh, it used to be $100 oil. Last week we hit uh, 106 in day trading and 105 in a closing price, which was above the inflation adjusted highest price in history. Uh, at the point it reached its peak, the uh, chairman of ExxonMobil Rex Tillotson said, you know, this is not a supply problem. We're not having supply disruptions at this moment. So it's not because of uh, Iran doing something or uh, some pipeline or, or facility being blown up or something like that. It's just the market at work. And OPEC's leadership rejected our <coughs> uh, outreach program this week, saying our problem uh, was that we were managing our economy badly and we had created a weak dollar, which is probably pretty accurate. So this map from the uh, Wall Street Journal down at the bottom, if you can see it, it's, it just shows uh, relative national oil consumption around the world. And if you could read it, if you were a little closer and I were a better scanner, it would show you that the United States uses about 25% of the world's oil that uh, uh, we are the leading consumer in the world. Uh, some, uh, Saudi Arabia is higher per capita now uh, because they've been using a lot of oil to grow their economy. At the same time, uh, they're producing a lot of oil. So we're addicted to an energy source that we can't control and that is owned mostly by hostile or unfriendly nations. This dependence on oil has basically more than doubled as a percentage of our use and tripled in nominal numbers since uh, over the last 20 years. And we, we should know uh, that we can't drill our way to oil or energy independence. We spend more than $400 billion a year now buying foreign oil. Many households across the country are actually spending more on fuel, a wasting asset, than they are on housing, which is an appreciating equity asset. The, the nation spends more than $100 billion a year, in addition, defending oil around the world, different transportation routes and oil fields and such. And of course, the two biggest wars since Vietnam were both in oil country. Uh, the uh, Kuwait Gulf War of 1991-92 and then the Iraq War. So if you, if you had a planimeter and you could measure the amount of money going into oil uh, today and in the 1970s, even with the inflation adjustment, our uh, current expenditures on oil would rival those uh, as a percentage of our economy as an absolute number that we were uh, hit with during the embargoes of the 1970s. The McKinsey Global Institute put out a report in uh, January uh, about the coming oil windfall in the Gulf and indicated that these foreign, uh, oil, these oil exports in the Gulf nations probably amounted to I think it was four to six trillion dollars this decade. That is with a weak dollar. If the dollar recovers and comes back to former strength, that uh, amount of money will represent 10 trillion dollars in buying power in today's uh, dollar. So we, we don't know how much of that uh, uh, trillions and trillions of dollars is going to support Al Qaeda, uh, Hezbollah, Hamas, but we know some of it is, and we know that we are um, exacerbating the security and, and uh, terrorism type issues in the Middle East uh, because we're throwing, we as a world community, not just the United States, are throwing so much money into that region. Oil is also busting household budgets in the United States. When people are forking out three times as much to drive their cars every day, they're less likely to be able to meet their mortgage, monthly mortgage payments, obviously. That's especially true of people who were in the mortgage market 
and as they say, drove till they qualified. You know, they were looking for an affordable home, which sometimes meant a much longer commute. And when oil prices rise, it's that particular wedge of the economy that's most affected, that wedge of uh, homeowners who were marginal to begin with, who had the highest transportation burden, and who were least able in an energy price pinch like we're in today to carry both their housing costs and their transportation costs. And of course, the, uh, the price of oil has effects all through the economy, not just in transportation, but in food, in heating, in production, materials, uh, manufacturing, everything. So we're seeing that now in this uh, threat of a recession. Well, who loves the United States? Mexico uh, has been one of our two leading uh, oil trade partners, Mexico and Canada. We get most of our, uh, we get 20% of our oil from Mexico and Canada. They're good oil trading partners, but Mexico's production is falling rapidly. Uh, Canada, uh, Canadians in reaction to debate over NAFTA in the Democrat presidential campaign last week said, uh, maybe they would start sending their tar, tar sands oil to China instead of us because uh, that was some leverage they had in the United States in the NAFTA debate. Uh, we're not maintaining uh, good production or good enough relations with those two major partners. When Iran took uh, 15 British so uh, sailors uh, hostage last March a year ago, uh, it caused a, a jump in oil prices over $70 a barrel. Uh, created shock waves throughout the uh, oil industry, throughout the oil economy. Um, Iran might have done that first to rattle sabers in the Middle East. It might have done that to uh, show the United States that our Iraqi intervention wasn't scaring them. It might have uh, done it in part to drive up oil prices. We don't know, but there are many reasons for Iran to have acted the way it did. The problem is that we weren't ready for it, and that we uh, are so subject to what happens in these international oil markets. And we are uh, subject to these precipitous changes in oil prices more than other economies that have become much more efficient. So we need to uh, face the fact that there is an instability and security premium already in the price of oil, and that whenever there's an international incident, uh, it affects the pr us and the price of oil and increases that instability premium. Most of the countries that control oil are unstable. Right now, today, people are saying the price of oil is going up because of tension between Venezuela and Colombia on their border. You know, that's kind of far-fetched for us to be uh, affected by something like that so significantly. The uh, Chinese are sidling up to the Sudanese because of oil. Hugo Chavez is uh, taking on the anti-American mantle that Fidel used to wear. And uh, he's doing it with oil and money, which Fidel never had. Uh, guerrillas and terrorists are uh, threatening uh, oil facilities around the world as well. Uh, last April, the Saudis captured 170 uh, supposed alleged terrorists that they said we're going to try to blow up one of the largest oil distribution facilities in the world. And uh, in Iran, where the oil minister, or in Iraq, I'm sorry, where the oil minister, just by coincidence, uh, is named Jihad, the uh, parliament is still unable to strike an agreement on how they'll manage their vast oil reserves. Let's just look quickly at Russia. Russia controls about half the world's natural gas. And uh, you might not know it, but now Russia is the world's largest exporter of oil, 10 million barrels a day, which is 15% more than Saudi Arabia even exports. Russia is exerting its muscle in European markets uh, and punishing some former satellites that aren't cooperating. It's. Uh, uh, creating conditions where other countries nearby, including Western European nations, are reluctant to challenge the Russian bear. It's also working closely with Iran on 
weapons and nuclear uh, programs. Russia uh, is further collaborating with Qatar and Iran on creation of an international natural gas cartel. And natural gas has been divided kind of into a mosaic of markets around the world because it's been relatively expensive and difficult to transport compared to oil. But uh, the price of natural gas is justifying that kind of uh, uh, in investment today. And Russia and Iran and Qatar are thinking, well, why shouldn't we have an OPEC-like cartel for natural gas in the future? The world wants and needs what Russia's got. In this photograph down at the end from the oil shockwave uh, report three or four years ago that came out of Texas A&M, you'll see uh, Robert Gates on your far left there. Uh, Robert Gates subsequently became the U.S. Defense Secretary. In this exercise, this oil shockwave exercise, they looked at the potential for a, t a terrorism incident, a war, a confrontation, a uh, sabotage act, something like that, to create uh, a big shock, price shock in world oil markets, perhaps $100 or $150 a barrel. Now, four years later, we're at over $100 a barrel without that kind of uh, shock in the form of uh, terrorism or a single incident or something like that. So the oil insecurity and instability uh, premium has really taken hold in oil markets over those years, even though there hasn't been a successful major event. Some of the costs of our addiction uh, in the international markets, it's, it's pretty significant in international policy. Uh, Oscar Wilde said, a cynic is someone who knows the price of everything and the value of nothing. We have not even figured out the price of this oil addiction. We haven't taken it seriously and we haven't addressed it. We know that we can't change world oil markets. We just have to be a much smaller player in them. And you'll notice I'm not blaming the oil companies for any of this. The oil companies are doing what they do, and they're doing it very well and very efficiently. It's not their fault or something like that. I'm just saying, and I don't want to bash them for high profits or anything like that. I'm just saying, as a nation, we have an interest in policy and energy policy that we have not protected, and we've simply turned over that kind of policy decision-making and policy direction to uh, uh, the industry rather than uh, taking care of it ourselves. For instance, uh, non-solutions proposed by uh, oil addicts, um, the Energy and Policy Acts in Congress in 2005 and 2007, uh, again encouraging more and more domestic production, uh, not really addressing how to deal with long-term uh, alternatives, um, creating probably more of an addiction over time Coal to liquids, tar sands, uh, oil shale, all create more carbon than uh, petroleum itself, the way we've used it to date. Uh, they seriously wor worsen the climate changing impacts of our reliance on uh, hydrocarbons. Uh, we just learned a about a month ago from some studies in Science magazine that uh, Ethanol production is probably also a carbon uh, loser as well because of the land use impacts and the conversion of forests and ag lands, not just the production of uh, production carbon costs of a well to wheels type uh, analysis of, of ethanol where you know you have to pay for fertilizer and tractors and transportation, all these other refining costs and production costs. It's also because we're converting land that used to hold carbon, and that's being released into the atmosphere. So really, what are we going to do about it? Uh, this is one thing. The headline says, auto chiefs make headway against a mileage increase. And as I recall, that's the head of GM, Ford, and Chrysler, uh, all saying, you know, any kind of an increase in mileage fuel economy standards was going to be bad for the economy and bad for the industry. 
eventually they agreed to an increase in fuel economy standards to 35 miles a gallon by 2020, which in my view is pretty pathetic. Europe and Japan are both aiming for 50 miles a gallon at the same time. We're just putting ourselves farther behind the curve, farther under the curve by having these small goals and achieving them uh, slowly. Uh, look, consumers save money when we build efficient vehicles. It only takes, with oil prices where they are right now, it only takes a couple years to pay back the capital investment in an individual car or in the industry for lighter materials, more efficient engines, like uh, hybrid diesel engines, for instance, that would probably be 50, 60 percent more efficient than what we have today for uh, new types of fuels. Um, but we're just avoiding, again, even in this huge crisis that we're in that's affecting so many people around the country, we're avoiding the real solutions. As John, uh, John McCain said, thank you, as John McCain said uh, in one of these recent uh, presidential debates, he said, why are we afraid to innovate? Why are, we why are we underestimating the American people? You know, they want to solve problems like these, and uh, we know it's a problem. We ought to do something about it. That's not an endorsement of John McCain. It's to show that there's a bipartisan interest in solving these problems. This is uh, what Detroit is reaping from what Congress and the uh, automakers have sown. This is tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of jobs, not just in Detroit, but in states all across the country. You know, we're putting our world-leading automotive industry in the back seat. It's a shame and somebody ought to do something about it. While Detroit was uh, lobbying against the uh, mileage standards, the oil industry was blaming biofuels for keeping gas prices high. You know, that's a dodge. That's not what we ought to be talking about. Uh, this is the front page of the New York Times. It's not where that kind of argument belongs. The chemical and fertilizer industries in this country have either shut down or moved or uh, are dealing with very high costs because of how we're uh, using our hydrocarbon resources. Uh, a friend of mine at Dow Chemical once said, using natural gas to uh, generate electricity is like uh, washing your dishes with Jack Daniels. <laughs> you know, it's got chemical properties that we ought to be using, not for BTUs, but for chemical process. And uh, uh, instead, because of our energy policy right now, uh, electric generators are moving to natural gas across the country and we're just creating more and more of a potential problem for ourselves, especially if this uh, international gas cartel comes together. We should uh, conserve instead of uh, using everything. I, I sometimes say to our children, we, uh, we ought to let you guys make some of your own mistakes. You know, uh, we, this generation doesn't have to make all the mistakes for the future. You know, maybe we could leave something in the ground and you guys could actually uh, do something stupid yourselves. So the first three solutions, I bet you're pretty glad to get to some of the solutions, are uh, efficient uh, engines, basically. Cars, trucks, planes, rail. We need to uh, move to uh, much more efficient engines, uh, hybrid engines in some cases, electric engines, which are three to five times as efficient in uh, uh, just pure energy application. That means fuel economy standards, uh, the California car standard, uh, which the uh, EPA announced it would oppose the day that the president signed the new energy bill with the 35 mile a gallon uh, fuel economy standard. I'm sure it was a coincidence. It was the first time the uh, Environmental Protection Agency had denied a California request for a waiver allowed under federal, the Federal Clean Air Act. And uh, uh, more than a dozen states are challenging in court. They represent more than half the nation's population. This, uh, this could be a huge battle when 
the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency is actually opposing standards that could be much more significant in fuel economy than the uh, uh, standards adopted by Congress in a weak compromise bill. The second thing we have to do is incent people to uh, adopt uh, new technologies such as plug-in cars. Electric cars, like I said, are uh, much more efficient. They also give you the opportunity to regulate carbon emissions at a central source where we're accustomed to trying to figure out the appropriate regulatory uh, policy. So we should give consumers the opportunity for uh, uh, competition and choice in how they're going to fuel their car. You know, if we allow them to plug in their car, they get to decide, do they want to buy gasoline or pay to fill up at a plug? Right now, probably a quarter, 20% to 25% the cost of fueling your car for that same 100 miles with gasoline. Right now, the uh, U.S. transportation uh, economy runs on 97% liquid fuels, mostly, obviously, petroleum. That's not a competitive situation. It's not the kind of situation where consumers get to, to move and help drive down the price of that, that oil. We also need to reduce uh, vehicle miles traveled, or VMT, um, which have been growing about twice the rate of population in the United States. We need dedicated bike, bike lanes, smart growth, electrified high-speed rail corridors and select corridors. Uh, we need efficient transit. Uh, we use about two-thirds of our oil for transportation. So if we make changes in these areas, uh, we could really have a big effect. And over the long run, one of the biggest things we can do is smart growth. Uh, reducing that VMT uh, is especially critical after 2020. I heard the New York State Highway Commissioner say last week that a, suburb, a rural New Yorker drives 17,000 miles a year. A, uh, an urban New Yorker drives 5,000 miles a year. It's probable that a suburbanite actually drives the most, and I did, I did not hear that number. If we don't stop current VMT trends, we will erase the gains under the congressional fuel economy standard that I just criticized. The 35 miles a gallon doesn't matter if we continue to uh, drive our cars more the way we have been. And here in the Southwest, we have great opportunities for bike lanes, for uh, dedicated bike facilities, for actually providing people a really livable, comfortable way of commuting and, tr and moving around by uh, bicycle. Additionally, smart transportation implies some mode shifting for freight hauling from uh, truck to uh, rail in particular. Solutions four and five on the oil crisis in particular are uh, international. The first is to beef up the North American Energy Council with uh, Mexico and Canada, agree about how we're going to deal with the oil trade, invest in improvements in Mexico's economy and oil industry in particular, but then extend beyond that. Let's be looking at a continental electric grid where we develop renewables in the best place, where we uh, have smart grid technology that we share across the continent, where we uh, help uh, develop efficiency uh, in other economies. You know, if we bought efficiency in Saudi Arabia or Mexico, we could we could free up millions of barrels of uh, oil a day. So let's go to Mexico and help them think about efficiency and, and think about some of these alternatives we're looking at as well. We also need to gradually reduce our police presence in the world. Over the next 10 years, we ought to be saying, for instance, in the Gulf, consumers, oil consumers, oil producers, large developed nations, let's sit down together and figure out how to create a multilateral peacekeeping presence in the Gulf rather than have the United States, Britain, uh, France, Germany, to a much lesser degree, protect the Gulf. We're a target in the Gulf. We probably make things worse in the Gulf by being such a large presence. 
Uh, Iran and Saudi Arabia have always uh, disliked each other, but they have a common interest in making sure that their oil gets out. Uh, they ought to be able to figure out uh, at least how to make sure that the Gulf stays peaceful and we don't have to spend so much money doing it. Solutions also create problems, uh, and I want to get into some of that right now. For instance, if um, if we do succeed in converting to more electric energies, energy is that ten minutes with questions or uh, without? Okay, so I better go twice as fast as I'm going. Um, so if we convert to uh, so many electric engines, we could end up creating a lot of uh, pressure in the electric sector in particular for uh, electricity that's right now heavily um, pr uh, generated by coal, about 50%. Uh, coal's been getting more expensive, and there's tremendous concern about it, its emissions because it emits so much, it contains so much more carbon than oil and much, much more than uh, natural gas. Coal's challenge is to figure out how to uh, produce low carbon uh, energy. It's very expensive. It hasn't been tried very much. Uh, coal's challenge is also that when we put a coal plant on the ground, it lasts for 60 years. If it's a conventional pul pulverized coal plant, we're buying a uh, future carbon emissions profile that's very significant, as opposed to an automobile that might last 10 or 15 years. You know that that uh, investment in coal stays there and is very hard to get back out of the economy once it's put in. China's uh, putting up a new huge coal facility every week right now. We need an international solution so that developing countries as well as the United States can actually strip that carbon and sequester it economically. It might be that renewables and other alternatives turn out to be cheaper, but we have to start recognizing and paying the cost of that coal investment. Solution six is energy efficiency. Governor Huntsman has one of the finest programs in the country for energy efficiency. I, I would say he's got the most aggressive program in the West, which is a pretty darn good region for energy efficiency, and uh, something, some real leadership there. And that's a business-oriented leadership that's saying efficiency is cost-effective and it's good for our economy. McKinsey Global Institute just put out this uh, national analysis of what we can do to bring down our carbon emissions uh, in the American economy. Option one is energy efficiency. It's cost-effective. It, uh, it actually um, improves the economy, improves productivity pretty significantly. Japan and Europe are right now about twice as energy efficient across their economies as the United States. California is actually similar to Japan and Europe. They've held per capita electricity use constant over the last 20 years, uh, while U.S. consumption has generally increased per capita about 60 to 80 percent. It's a really phenomenal um, success given all the hot tubs and plasma TVs and McMansions and such that they have in California. But it's, a, it's an object lesson for us around the rest of the country. And we can do that partly by having more efficient buildings. We can probably save 50 percent of the energy in, that we use in buildings by designing them better and using better heating, uh, air conditioning systems, uh, appliances, lighting, etc. Western Governors Association did an analysis in 2006 and said with just cost-effective efficiency investments in the 18, then 18 Western states, we would save $53 billion over the next 15 years or so. And after that, the annual return on that investment would be about $21 billion. That's with a return on investment of 2.5 to 1. So that's very much a cost-effective investment. We should also be doing things to make the uh, Grid more efficient, um, high efficiency cable, uh, smart grid technology. And we should adopt an approach where we create incentives for utilities to want to do uh, efficiency by decoupling, as they call it, uh, profit so that they can make a profit off of efficiency, not just generation. And again, Utah has been a real leader in that as well. 
Uh, solution seven is renewables. Um, we've subsidized the oil industry, the nuclear industry, the hydro industry in this country. So they're all very large parts of our energy economy. But we now need to have long-term stable incentives for renewable development. Renewable portfolio standards that require a large amount of, uh, of renewable energy in our electricity portfolio. Additionally, long-term incentives such as the uh, investment and production tax credits that were extended in the 2005 Pol uh, Energy Policy Act but will expire at the end of this year. Um, industry cannot, the renewable industry cannot plan investment and maintain investment with that kind of up and down, off and on approach to uh, incentives. We also need to work on energy storage systems. It might turn out that wind and solar energy, which are intermittent and you can't use them as base load, are less expensive to turn into base load by using compressed air, hot water systems that might uh, allow you to trickle that energy out instead of use it when it spikes as nature provides it. Um, it might turn out that's less expensive than these big investments in, in coal and such. And coal uh, sequ uh, carbon sequestration and such. The Tory leader in Britain said climate change is the biggest international challenge. Here's a conservative who wants to conserve. There's uh, France, the presidents of France and Germany are both from the conservative parties. They're saying the same thing. We ought to get on board with that. Carbon levels are spiraling around the world. Uh, scientists, oops, scientists agree. This is a statement by 11 national, the leading 11 national academies of science four or five years ago saying, you know, we know the risk is there. We know that, and it's very probable that if we don't take these actions, we are going to pay much larger costs in the long run. Here in the West, we can expect more drought, more wildfire, uh, because the heating season, the summer, will be longer and hotter. It'll be harder to store surface water. Uh, we'll have much more evaporation. It's going to be a big challenge for us in the West, and we ought to get ready for it. We're going to see more wildfire. So one of the f solutions here at home is, uh, uh, well, I'm sorry, internationally is to start uh, negotiating international limits, figure out how to pay that margin for doing it right in the developing nations, and uh, then implementing national and regional um, solutions to the carbon problem like we're working on here in the West with uh, a carbon cap and trade program that uh, uh, seven Western governors are working on together, again, including Governor Huntsman. Solution nine is that we have to freeze conventional coal. As I said, when you put a conventional coal plant into the energy mix, you buy 60 years of carbon emissions. Until we can prove systems that will remove carbon from flue gas, we should not be building more conventional plants. The next solution is a carbon market. Cap and trade internationally and inside the United States will create a price for carbon emissions. It will set a limit on carbon emissions, and it will uh, allow industry the flexibility to respond as it sees fit. So industry will decide, OK, you know, this year we're going to continue doing what we're doing, but next year we're going to put uh, some of our capital investment into efficiency to avoid paying for the carbon permits we used to have to buy. So trying to leash and harness that market force and push back on carbon emissions is critical. It's been very successful. I mentioned I'd been in Vermont back uh, in the old days when the uh, acid rain uh, cap and trade system was put in the Clean Air Act. It's been enormously effective. It's given the industries a lot of flexibility, and it's come in at about one-eighth the cost that was projected. So that's 10 easy steps. Denmark is doing it. Uh, the uh, United States is way behind, but we can catch up. We have the energy. We have the ideas. We have the people, entrepreneurs. We have scientists. We should go ahead and get at it. The worst thing we can do uh, if we stop doing these um, Band-aids and baby steps is create a better future for our children, a stronger economy, a more resilient economy, a more productive economy, 
uh, a cleaner air, a uh, cleaner world, probably preventing climate change, disastrous, catastrophic climate change. And uh, we ought to get on it right away in an optimistic way that harnesses these forces and pushes America to achieve the kind of things it did when it took on big national challenges like World War II and uh, getting someone onto the moon. So thank you very much. I don't, do we have any time for questions? We have one minute. <laughs> Sorry about that. Does anybody uh, want to make a comment or ask a question? Go ahead. I'm just wondering, uh, comparing your cap and trade and your market solutions to the experience we've seen in cap and trade, particularly in Europe, where it's accomplished absolutely nothing, and with uh, various uh, governing agencies and states saying you have to look at least cost plus reliability so costs are not internalized by the market, why not just say, look, let's put a, let's put a tax on carbon because market solutions, the way we've typically looked at markets, just aren't going to get there. Cap and trade has never worked when it has to do with carbon. We can't get a carbon market in cap and trade because it's so complex. How do you cap and trade with a tailpipe? Oil's 44% of our, of, of our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, markets don't work. Um, well, the European system did not work. You're right. And it was because they handed out so many allowances for free at the beginning. They're start, they've tightened that up. And I think over the next few years, the European market will succeed. Car, our, uh, cap and trade has worked in the S and RAND example. So I don't think that it's a for, I don't think at all it's a foregone conclusion that it can't work. I think you can apply it to uh, the transportation market as well. We need a low carbon fuel standard that says, in aggregate, we're going to reduce the amount of carbon in the transportation sector by X amount over X number of years. That provides the kind of cap and then you can trade the allowances uh, or the permits underneath that cap. But the, uh, the point is to let industry do it. A carbon tax across the economy first doesn't create a limit. When the economy's hot, people pay the tax, the carbon goes into the atmosphere. The second thing it does is it really hurts, especially lower income people and people who are most uh, affected by uh, the price of carbon. You can't calibrate that price as a governmental taxing entity the way the market will when the permits are being traded. We probably will either set that price too high or too low. Additionally, we hear that probably gasoline has to reach $8 a gallon uh, before there will be a real effect on uh, a significant downward long-term effect on how people invest. So. Uh, when you talk about a carbon tax, you're talking about a very large amount of money versus cap and trade, which is probably going to represent a much larger, smaller expense. Um, I don't want to go over my time. I see some more hands up, and I, I want to be respectful here. I also was expecting somebody to say something about nuclear. So, who who was going to ask me about who was going to who was going to ask me about nuclear? You were. Go, go ahead. Uh, nuclear people often represented as a uh, low carbon or carbon free alternative. It is uh, much better than our conventional uh, generation sources, but uh, there are large costs to nuclear that are not being uh, represented in the cost that comes through your, uh, on your electric bill. For instance, the industry estimates that because the federal government has failed to provide a waste facility uh, U.S. tax payers will have to pay about $35 billion in penalties to the companies that are storing the waste because Yucca Mountain hasn't opened. Yucca Mountain is probably not going to open. I would say 90% unlikely to open is my guess. We're not going to have long-term storage. The French are doing it in dry casks on site for uh, 100, 200 years. Seems to be a good solution for the waste we've already got in place because we're not going to it's going to be very difficult to find a permanent storage facility. Reprocessing, or as some in the industry mislabel it, recycling uh, creates uh, more radioactive material. We have to be very careful about that. Proliferation is a serious problem. We keep hearing about trade in these uh, uh, radioactive materials in the, in the black market as well as the open market. Uh, you know, we don't want to be increasing that kind of material in the world today. The third issue about nuclear is that there really is a connection between weapons and uh, electricity generation. 
in that uh, here in the United States is choosing uh, right now winners and losers in nuclear. We're saying, nope, North Korea and Iran should not have nuclear. Well, we know Pakistan does. We know India. We want to encourage India to do more. We can't predict how those nations are going to look on us 10 or 15 or 20 years from now. They talk about human error being a problem in nuclear technology, and it's been reduced significantly by much better technology. But I think it's uh, human error, perhaps human, human folly, to think that we can predict how nuclear materials are going to move around the world, proliferate, fall into the wrong hands, et cetera. Nuclear is an important part of today's uh, generating mix. We have to be very careful about how we manage it. We haven't come up with long-term solutions yet. And although it's attractive from a carbon point of view, there are a lot of other issues that I think make efficiency and renewables and some of the things I'm trying to lay out a preferable option for the next 20 years or so. So I hope we'll go that avenue rather than a large expansion of our nuclear fleet. Thank you very much.